much, Sandy. Thank you all. Uh, it's so great to be here. My parents immigrated to Taiwan and met at UC Berkeley. Uh, my brother's named after the Lawrence Observatory, so I'm something of a local product. <laughs> my father got his PhD in physics uh, at Berkeley and generated 69 patents over his career at GE and IBM. I was born in Schenectady, New York, but I have to say, yes, <laughs> Schenectady, New York, where my father was at GE. Uh, but I have to say, every time someone asks me whether I'm from the West Coast, I take it as a compliment. <laughs> uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Andrew Yang. I'm running for president as a Democrat in 2020. And you all have been incredible activists and leaders in the Asian American community for years. And most of you never heard of me until maybe just now, <laughs> maybe like six months ago. It's like, who is this person and how is he running for president at this point? So I'm going to retrace my steps and let you know why I'm here. And then uh, hopefully you'll see why I, I'm running and why we need to step up at the highest levels. So. Uh, I grew up in upstate New York. I went to Brown University, studied economics and political science, and I went to law school at Columbia, uh, like some of your children probably. And I was an unhappy attorney for five months in New York, um, <laughs> thought it was not a great job. And so I left, as Sandy said, I left to start a business. I left to start a technology business in the first dot-com bubble that did not work out. But then I worked at another healthcare software company, and then I became the head of an education company that grew to become number one in the United States and was acquired by a public company in 2009. So I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been working in tech and business. And then in 2009, when my company was acquired, you all remember that was the depths of the financial crisis, where it's like the financial sector was exploding and mortgages were all going, uh, going under. And so I, at that point, I felt like there was something deeply wrong with what was going on in the country. And at the time, I thought the best thing I could do would be to train hundreds of young entrepreneurs to go work in cities like Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, Baltimore, New Orleans, Birmingham, to build new businesses. I thought that we had too much talent going to Wall Street and Silicon Valley, and not enough going to the Midwest and South, and that that was going to end up tearing our country apart and leading to a very divided economy and society. So I came up with this in 2011. I quit my job. I donated 120,000 of my own to seed Venture for America. I started calling wealthy friends, asking them, do you love America? The savvy among them said, what does it mean if I say yes? And then I said, at least $10,000. And so 12 people said, I love America for $10,000. So our budget was a quarter million. It grew and grew. This year, our budget's around $7 million, thousands of applicants, hundreds of fellows, created several thousand jobs. I was awarded. Uh, uh, presidential ambassadorship from uh, the Obama White House. Uh, documentary was made about my organization that's now on Netflix, if you like documentaries. And so I spent seven years traveling the Midwest and the South. How many of you all are from the West Coast? Uh, East Coast like me, New York, Midwest, South, Pacific Northwest? So I had never been to Michigan, Ohio, uh, Alabama before running Venture for America. And I have to say, it was a real eye-opener, where a woman in Ohio said to me, around here, change is a four-letter word. And I did not know what she meant. And then over time, I grew to understand what she meant was that in Ohio, change meant businesses closing and people leaving. Where if you were very, very talented in Northeast Ohio, the goal was to leave. And so she started having a more and more negative attitude about progress and change. But this really hit home to me when Donald Trump became our president in 2016. Now, some of you, uh, you know, had different reactions to Donald Trump becoming president, but I saw this as a massive cry for help. I said, wow, this country must be getting really desperate if we elected that guy, the narcissist reality star, as our president. There must have been like a lot of pain, a lot of anger, a lot of distress. And so I started looking into why he won and there's a very, very strong direct correlation upward between the ad adoption of industrial robots in a voting district and the movement towards Donald Trump. There's one very clear reason why Donald Trump is our president today. It is that we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, all of the swing states that Donald Trump needed to win and did win. And how many of you all work in technology here in Silicon Valley? Some of you. 
So if you work here, you know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we're about to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the truck drivers, the fast food workers, and on and on through the economy. We are in the third inning of the greatest economic and technological transformation in the history of the world. And the third inning has brought us Donald Trump. The fourth, fifth, sixth innings will bring their own set of problems. And so I was coming to grips with this. Again, I started an organization to create jobs. I created several thousand jobs around the US. And I realized that my organization was pouring water into a bathtub that has a giant hole ripped in the bottom. And so then what do you do about the giant hole ripped in the bottom? So I wrote a book uh, called The War on Normal People about what's happening in the economy. And then I started to go to Washington, DC, visiting with my friends who are policymakers and lawmakers, saying, guys, what are we going to do about this economic transformation? And what do you all think that the lawmakers and policymakers said to me when I asked them this question? Not much one can do. The, the three answers I got were, we cannot talk about that. We should study that further. And the third, the most reasonable, competent sounding one was, we must educate and retrain Americans for the jobs of the future. And then I said, I looked at the independent studies, and the effectiveness rate of government funded retraining programs uh, are approximately 0%. The, the independent studies have it at between 0 and 15%. And fewer than 10% of American workers qualify for retraining programs anyway. It's not like when a mall closes, there's an uh, army of government employees standing there being like, oh, we're here to retrain you. Like, that doesn't happen in real life. And 30% of malls are going to close in the next four years. The average retail worker is a 39-year-old woman with a high school education making between 11 and $12 an hour. So when I realized that our government was completely out to lunch on this really the elephant in the room that led to Donald Trump being elected and is changing our economy and society forever, I realized it's like, wow, like if our political system does not wake up to this reality, my kids, your kids are going to grow up in a very, very different country than I grew up in. And that country I'm going to suggest is not going to necessarily be embracing Asian Americans because this country is heading towards being majority minority in 2045, which is only 27 years away. It's like, one, one and a half generations. And the history of the world uh, does not have many examples of a dominant financial and political ethnic group voluntarily relinquishing its dominance when, <laughs> when other groups become more numerous. That's actually not historically normal. The norm is unfortunately in the other direction. And that's going to be compounded by the fact that the American government, the American culture, likes to have a boogeyman or an enemy. And who do we all think the most likely boogeyman is going to be of this next generation? It's likely to be China. And so you're going to see this increasingly restive, insecure, and economically insecure white shrinking majority class looking for enemies and scapegoats. Because it's very, very hard to tell the the people that are losing their manufacturing jobs and truck driving jobs, like, hey, it's progress, they're going to find some place to cast blame. And so this is what we have to address. We have to wake people up to the fact that it's not immigrants, it's not uh, whatever else we're blaming, it's not like, you know, build a wall, it's not like irresponsible businesses, it's the fact that we're going through the series of economic and technological transformations that just make human beings less relevant to more and more businesses. And I mentioned truckers. Being a truck driver is the most common job in 29 states in this country. Now, we don't know that because I don't know many Asian American truck drivers, but there are three and a half million truckers in this country. Average age, 49, 94% male. Average education, high school. They make $46,000 a year. Now, how long do we think it's going to be before the robot trucks start hitting the highways? Five. One year. One year, five years, 10 years. <laughs> When I talk to my friends in Silicon Valley, they tell me it's five to 10 years. Now, when those robot trucks start hitting the highways, how do we think these hundreds of thousands, these millions of truckers are gonna take it? Not well. Not well. <laughs> and only 13% of them are unionized. You can't even negotiate a grand solution. Like 87% of them are in mom and pop businesses. So what do we think the odds are of some truckers getting drunk, 
saying like ro no robots going to take my job and then like trashing robot trucks or rioting or like parking their truck across the highway it strikes me that that's actually very likely because about 100,000 of them are ex military and 350,000 of them own their own trucks so imagine sinking your life savings into owning a truck and then having a robot truck that you can't compete against so this is the reality now this is the stuff our politicians will not talk about and our politicians will not talk about it because they don't understand technology they tend not to understand the economy and they certainly don't understand the way those those interact so this is why i am running for president i'm running for president to wake people up to the fact that the real problems are not immigrants um, uh, but the real problems, it's not even a problem if we get ourselves together as a society, is that progress is continuing at such a rapid pace that more and more Americans are in danger of being left behind. So my platform is, revolves around a few big ideas. The first is a universal basic income where every American citizen gets $1,000 a month, free and clear, no questions asked. And that would be transformative for tens of millions of American families. Education rates would go up health would go up, mental health would go up, domestic violence would go down, hospital visits would go down. It would make Americans more rational and open and optimistic about the future. Because right now, 57% of Americans can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. And if you can't pay your bills, it has the functional impact of decreasing your IQ by 13 points, which is one standard deviation. So if anyone here thinks America is getting dumber, it is. It's getting dumber because people can't pay their bills, and not being able to pay your bills actually makes you less rational. So that's the first big step, which I have branded the freedom dividend because Americans love freedom. It tested much better with, uh, as the freedom dividend than it did anything else. So number one is a freedom dividend. Number two is trying to get health care off the backs of American families and businesses. Um, some of you are probably doctors. Um, any, raise your hand if you're a doctor. How do you feel about this? No doctors? Excellent. <laughs> Nurse. Just, that's even better. It's even better, Lily. Uh, so one of the problems that's making Americans miserable is that 94% of the new jobs created since 2005 have been temporary gig or contractor jobs that don't have health care benefits. And so people are struggling with their health care. So we need to separate health care from work, particularly in an era where fewer and fewer Americans are going to have full-time jobs anyway. And then the third thing is we have to come up with better ways to measure our economic progress because GDP is something we made up almost 100 years ago and it's going to keep going up and up even as more and more Americans get left behind. So we need to start evolving GDP to include things like mental health, childhood success rates, environmental quality, median income and affordability, and get people focused around actually trying to improve Americans' ways of life. Because we all know that you deliver what you measure. And right now, this society is measuring the wrong things. So the inventor of GDP was a guy, he's an immigrant actually, you guys will like this, named Simon Kuznets. We came up with it during the Great Depression and then he said at the time, this is a terrible measurement for national well-being and we should not use it as that. And yet that's exactly what we've done almost 100 years later. So Donald Trump is president today in part because he identified a series of problems. Um, but then his solutions were freeze time, turn the clock backwards, build a wall, uh, keep immigrants out. And I want to do the exact opposite where I, we need to move the clock forward, we need to move our society and government forward, we need to have people actually become excited about the future we're entering because the alternative is going to be disastrous for Asian Americans and for all Americans. And the message I deliver to the people of Iowa, New Hampshire, and across the country is that the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who loves math. <laughs> so that is all why I'm running for president today. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Our campaign is growing by leaps and bounds every single day. But you all are leaders. I've admired many of your work, like much of your work from afar and would absolutely love to get to know you, have you get to know me, and take some questions. Thank you all very much, and thank you, Sandy, for having me today. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, shout it out. Yeah. Sorry, I have the mic and you don't. I'll give you guys a mic. <laughs> okay, uh, Lydia. Okay, guys. Who 
a question. Oh, oh sorry. Go ahead. Well, oh, Andrew, my name is Andrew Jen as well. I love, I like this freedom dividends, and I know, but most of our Asian American or Chinese American primarily over here, they're all above the middle age and above the middle income as well. So how your policy could persuade or penetrate the whole American here, all of them Asian American? Thank oh. you. Sure. So I, I spoke to a group of 70 CEOs that were convened by JP Morgan about the freedom dividend. And uh, what I suggested to them is what I suggest to Asian Americans is that markets and consumers will be healthier when people have money to spend. So if you're uh, doing well as an Asian American, I sense that many of us are doing well in this room, like our businesses, our investments would be in position to do better if the American consumer has actual money to spend in our businesses, like and able to participate in our financial system uh, and in other ways. And plus we would receive the freedom dividend too. This is not a, a, a system where you have to make below a certain amount of money to get the freedom dividend because we have to destigmatize it and make it essentially uh, right of citizenship because um, Americans don't like handouts. Americans don't like feeling like, oh, you know, like someone's better than me and I'm getting this and you're not. So the way to destigmatize, say, like everyone can get it, everyone op opts in. Um, so that's why I think it'll be appealing to people at every level of America because even for us, even though we're quite prosperous and our kids are educated and whatnot, it'll still be a massive stress relief knowing that our kids also are going to get $1,000 a month at age 18. And so if they want to go to school, they'll have it partially paid for, et cetera, et cetera. And we can do it in a way that puts the agency and decision making into the hands of the individual as opposed to having the government make that decision. Lily. Yeah. Hi, Andrew. Thank you so much. So I'm so glad that you talk about um, health care, particularly mental health. So what is your platform to engage the voters and connect with the people in healthcare in general and mental health? Um, so this country is experiencing a mental health crisis. I don't know how many of you uh, have experienced that in some ways individually. My brother is a psychology professor at NYU and uh, my, our parents are very proud. And that's a choice. And uh, uh, one of my policy elements um, is to have a psychologist in the White House because it actually doesn't make any sense to have people that have like, you know, like access to nuclear weapons and whatnot without some sort of mental health professional around. And I thought of this before our current president. <laughs> um, so we can destigmatize issues of mental health very powerfully and then we need to invest in it significantly at multiple levels. And we need to invest in a way that's more holistic because right now the Western method tends to rely upon lots of prescription drugs and the prescription drugs end up uh, sometimes causing their own set of adverse reactions. Uh, and so my brother, in his field, he's more of a, a behavioral and like a, um, clinical, like, you know, drugs are not the first resort. And, uh, and, but the, the problem there is that those processes tend to be more painstaking and, and um, take, they're more expensive oftentimes than just saying, here's the drug, uh, but they're better. So we need to invest in those resources and destigmatize and let people know that mental health is something that affects everybody. I think I can do this very effectively because like I, I'm not as much of like sort of like the macho, like, you know so what I mean? Like just talk about how everyone struggles. I think that would go a very long way. And my brother has some great policies too where apparently you can di diagnose things quite early for children um, if you uh, invest the resource to do so. Oh, thanks, Lily. Um, my, my name's Andrew Kim. Um, I'm with APAPA. I've, just a quick background, I've been a congressional staffer for about 10 years. I love all of the premises you mentioned. I want it from my time, I've worked with a lot of truck drivers with the Teamsters Union. I love the premise that um, you know, the technology is the issue and that the current administration is you know, trying to put a stop to that or trying to freeze time, I like what you said there. What is some examples of how we can address, for example, truck drivers? Because I, I talk with those labor unions. What could I tell them that Andrew has in plan for how we can address and mitigate technology disrupting the current industry? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. A lot of Andrews in this room. Um, <laughs> I, I spoke to some truck drivers myself last week, uh, and the reaction I got from them was something like, this is bullshit, we should like, make sure this is like, never legal to have a robot truck. That was like the general <laughs> reaction. 
it wasn't this bullshit is not happening, which is the reaction I got a year ago. A year ago, I was like, hey, robots are coming. They're like, no, they're not. That's bullshit. And now they're like, robots are coming. Uh, so, um, so trucking is a unique situation where you have most common job in 29 states. In addition to the 3.5 million truckers, uh, you have another 5 million Americans who work in truck stops, motels, and diners that count on the truck stopping. So this is going to be devastating for hundreds of communities around the country. Now, on the flip side, here in Silicon Valley, they are gunning for this because the cost savings are $168 billion per year in not just labor, but fuel efficiency, equipment utilization, fewer accidents. 4,000 Americans die in accidents with trucks every year, so this will probably save hundreds of lives. So it's very difficult to argue we should not do this. We should do it, but the, the, but the, the goal should be to include the truckers in some of the incredible value gains. Now, that's not going to happen by itself. So President Yang's plan, you can tell the truckers, is to have a trucking transition czar, probably Andy Stern, the former head of the SEIU, who will go in and say, look, self-driving truck companies, you're about to save tens of billions of dollars, and that is great. But some of that needs to go to the truckers to create this long-term transition window for them because without that, we're heading towards civil unrest and likely violence. So trucker transitions are plus freedom dividend uh, should equal, hopefully, because we're actually going to be saving enough money. We could, and I'm not recommending this, but we could actually pay the truckers their full salaries just to sit at home because um, the savings are that vast. You can believe that. So we need to, we need to split it up a little bit. Yes, Anthony. Oh, sorry, sorry, he had one. My bad, sorry. The economy is an important part of being a president, but it's not the only part. How would you handle Russia's aggression in the Ukraine and Crimea? Yes. So I think it's unfathomable that we know Russia's hacking our elections and everyone's like, well, they're doing it again. I mean, that's crazy. Like, I feel like the American government should say, look, very clearly, if we can verify that you are tampering with our elections, we'll consider that an act of aggression, and then we will respond very unkindly in various ways, freezing assets, uh, you know, doing something that the oligarchs in Russia would not like. Generally speaking, in terms of my foreign policy stance, I think our foreign policy actually reflects how we're doing at home, and that the weaker we are at home, then the more erratic and unreliable we get abroad. And then if we're doing really well at home, then people abroad regard us as more reliable and uh, are willing to invest for the medium and long term. I think one of the mistakes that American uh, presidents have made over the last couple of decades is they've imagined that we're capable of doing many things that we are not capable of doing. Uh, and so I would be very reluctant to invest American resources, lives, treasure abroad, unless there's a very, very clearly defined goal that I thought we could attain uh, and so I'm, I'm very restrained about, like, like I think that the, the American outlook has gotten us into uh, disaster after disaster over the last couple of decades, honestly. Um, so this goes back to the trucking one because, um, and this is actually helping me understand more about like how you're looking at the systematic view and such. So we're here for the truckers, we're here for the civil unrest part. How are you planning to talk to the businesses to convince them otherwise? Because sometimes money moves more than civil unrest or the fear of that. Yeah, so uh, again, and one of the reasons I think I'm a very effective messenger for this is I talk to CEOs, I'm friends with uh, many tech CEOs, and Sam Altman of Y Combinator is going to endorse me next week along with like uh, about 80 other techies. Um, and so the, the tech CEOs regard me as like a capitalist and business person, which I am. And what I suggest to them is like, look, you're just going to be doing better if your customers are more stable and have more money to spend and are not rioting. So it's like a pro-business measure uh, that most CEOs regard as a necessary step at some point. Uh, so I, I think people sense that I'm actually very pro-business because I am. I've run a company. Um, I've started companies. I'm a serial entrepreneur, um, which I think makes me a really effective messenger for this. Yeah. You know, Andrew, you being a Chinese-American and um, uh, U.S.-China relation, as you just mentioned, is uh, not that good at all. Uh, China is uh, both, and increasingly so, both a bogus man 
and a real competitor, if not a fierce adversary. So you being Chinese American running for the president of the United States, how does that cut it? Yes. So we have a running joke in the office about what Donald Trump's nickname will be for me. Um, and, we've, and, we've, and we've come up with Comrade Yang. You know, it's like, oh, Comrade Yang, at it again. So, um, which will be a very good day for the campaign when he decides to give me a nickname. Uh, but, so I'm a very proud Chinese American, Asian American. I think that having someone like me on the national stage would actually be a very, very positive thing for the community on, on multiple levels. Uh, I, I certainly think that there's going to be some mistrust among some subset of Americans about like having an Asian American president, though I think after people spend some time with me, that does disappear. Uh, I've been to Iowa seven times. I'm going back for an eighth time to headline a progressive event called Progress Iowa, uh, uh, December 20th. And when I talk to the Democrats of Iowa and New Hampshire, there's zero concern about my ethnic background. Uh, if anything, the smart Asian guy actually tends to work pretty well um, because if I'm talking about technology and numbers and math, um, they're like, yeah, he sounds like you know, he knows what he's talking about. Like this guy is like, <laughs> this guy's definitely done his homework. Yeah, it's two plus two. But I, I do want to suggest a few things about having an Asian American run for president. Um, so we, we tend to be relatively structured and responsible as a community, um, but the presidency as Sandy pointed out before, may be an exception to how this goes, where if Asian Americans wait for our turn, it will never arrive. I mean, that, that's just the truth of it. Like, if we wait for someone to say, hey, it's like time for this person, to run for president, like, don't hold your breath. <laughs> that's, that's not happening. Um, so it's going to have to be us putting ourselves forward and saying, look, oh my gosh, the got me. No. <laughs> Sorry. That's, that's, anyway. So... So we're going to have to put ourselves forward and say, look, we have a vision for the country. We can contribute. We can lead at the very highest levels. Uh, and that's the only way we're going to, to take a, a true leadership position in the society. The second thing is that Asian Americans have been somewhat marginalized politically for a number of reasons. And I cannot tell you how grateful I am to all of you here because you're all trying to counteract that. But you all know you're going against the grain because Asian Americans do not see politics as like a natural realm for them or competition. They feel somewhat still like foreign. They don't think it matters. They don't think political leaders care about them. Uh, and this election is an opportunity for us because we can actually, so uh, I was talking to, to uh, Sandy and some others. So California moved its voting date up um, where it is going to be the fifth state this time in the Democratic primary. So you have Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada, and then California. And in a very, very diverse field, it is not going to be decided by California. So California, by the time you guys vote in the primaries traditionally, it doesn't matter. It's already over. But, but this time, it will not be over. This time, Asian Americans can actually help decide who's going to be the president of the United States. And if I'm still in that picture, I have a feeling I'm going to get a significant proportion of the Asian Americans of California. Like, we have a chance to make a real difference on the political level. And the third thing, and the sort of the most personal element of it, is that as an Asian American man, I have had this sense, and some of you may have this sense as well, that um, I'm allowed to become this successful, but I'm not allowed to become this successful. Uh, you know, and certainly that is true in the political realm. And that's what we have to change, really. Because like many of you, I have been with senators and presidents and governors and the rest of it, and have realized what you all have realized as well, which is that we are just as smart, just as good, just as patriotic, just as moral as any of them, and that we can lead at the very highest levels. And so running for president as a Chinese American, I, I'm very, very excited about the potential of the campaign to help further a vision of what we can be in this society, that we are just as American as anyone else. All right. Hi, Anthony. This is Peter Nguyen. Uh, I just want to add on what you say. Uh, I'm great to hear what you're saying, but to add on the question, too, is it's all about timing. So the question for 2020 is the time for us as an Asian American or Chinese or whichever to run for, or is it this country ready for it? Or is it this country maybe the, the sleeping giant, the Latino, maybe the one that might try to go a uh, uh, female to be the president of this country? I mean, it's 2020 just around the corner. 
And then with ongoing relationship with China now, it might not help either. So I just wonder, is this, is this the right opportunity or should we wait or should we, I heard what you're saying, but you know, I, again, man, if we waited for the stars to align to be like, oh, now it's time for Asian Americans, we, we wait for a long time. Um, but but I, I will say, though, that I'm an entrepreneur and operator, and there are some key variables that, that will make me uh, a contender on that main debate stage. So imagine when the first Democratic primary debate takes place next summer. Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Andrew Yang. And imagine how much value that will have to our community. And the only thing standing between us right now and that happening is me getting 2% of Americans excited about the freedom dividend, which we can 100% do. And the, the key lever that's going to help us get there is the people of Iowa, because the national press turns to the people of Iowa to figure out who they like, who they're talking about. That's one reason why the fact that I've been invited to headline this progressive event at the end of this month is so enormous, because national press will be there. Now, I, I'm an operator, and so I've figured out some things I did not know ahead of time. What percent of Iowans do you think participated in the Democratic caucus in 2016? There are 3.1 million Iowans in the state. What percent do you think caucused uh, last time around? Very reasonable. The real number is 5.6%. There are only 170,000 Iowans who caucused in the Democratic caucuses last time. And the reason for that is manifold. But the main reason is that caucusing requires showing up and publicly arguing with your neighbors about who to support. It is not you go in, you like put, do a ballot, you get a sticker, and you walk out 10 minutes later. It's you show up and say, hey, I'm Andrew Yang, because he's the only one who's talking about the fact that all of our stores are closing because of Amazon, and he wants to give us all $1,000 to rebuild our Main Street economy. But you actually have to have that conversation with your neighbor. So uh, only 5.6% of Iowans participate in the Democratic caucus. So let's say that number goes from 170,000 to 200,000 in this cycle because of enthusiasm. How many Democrats do you think are going to run for president as a, um, this time? 20, 25, something along those lines. So here's the kicker. How many people do we need to get on the Andrew Yang bandwagon in Iowa for me to finish one, two, or three in Iowa if there are 200,000 caucus goers and 20 candidates? It's a math question. Come on. Come on, Asian American leaders. It's a... It's, it's maybe 30,000, maybe 35,000. Like you could win the whole thing on like 15%. So if we go, like it's like the stars are aligning for someone like me to become president, truly. Because you have a very, very broken up field. I do not need to win 50%. I only need to win about 15%. Can I get 30,000 Iowans on board with the fact that they should get $1,000 a month and rebuild their Main Street economy? I, I can. And if there's a video that CC has watched. The reason I'm here is because CC watched this video. Where's CC? <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm here is that CC watched this video. So there's a video of me on YouTube right now, me speaking to a thousand Iowans, like talking about this stuff. And I got a standing ovation at the end, and then I get invited back to speak at this other thing. So I can get the 30,000 Iowans. I can finish top three in Iowa. I can be front page news around the world January 2020 where the Asian man who wanted to give everyone money is now on track to become president. Like that's all very, very achievable. So this is a long-winded way of answering when you say like, hey, is it our time? We can make it our time. I think I like that comment. This will make that time. Uh, my name is Andy, you are another brother, <laughs> yeah. and I have one comment and one uh, question. My comment is, uh, I think six to eight years ago, when Obama came out run, majority of people think he does not, he did not have a chance, he went. So that's my comment. My question is, I checked some of information about you, I checked uh, your uh, business card, I don't see your slogan there. You know Obama has changed uh, Donald Trump, no matter like or not, make America great. Yeah, yeah. So what's your slogan, what's your priority one? Yes, Stop. so we, we have two slogans. The first is build the future, and the second is humanity first. So those are the slogans that we've been going around with, and they've, they've both been working uh, very, very well in different, different parts of uh, the country. So 
that's what we're leading with, a vision for the future and then an economy that puts people first. Um, Mr. Young, my name is YK. I ran for a little office in 2018 for city council. But one thing I would like to hear from you as a presidential candidate, yes, we can run the and win the primaries, but how, do you, how are you going to reach to the common man and win their vote and become our president in 2020? All right, so here's the path. It's so much fun. All right, so I finished top three in Iowa, front page news for a week. We get to New Hampshire, where I happen to go to high school, uh, which will help me a tiny bit. But if you look at their primary, it's an open primary, which means that independents and libertarians can participate in either one. Now, libertarians love the freedom dividend because it's the brainchild of a guy named Milton Friedman, who all libertarians idolize. Uh, and so the libert and libertarians are essentially the third party of New Hampshire. So if you can imagine the libertarians of New Hampshire, who are they going to uh, vote for? Like a lot of them are going to vote for me, and they're much more likely to vote in the Democratic primary than the Republican primary because the Republican primary is just going to be Donald Trump squashing Jeff Flake. Like no one's going to care. So it, so it's going. So they're going to come my way, and then South Carolina. Uh, is someplace I believe I can compete because African Americans actually really like the idea of the freedom dividend. Uh, and then Nevada, California, I can do well. So first things first is try and win the nomination, but I have a real path there. Now let's say I become the nominee. Then all I have to do to defeat Donald Trump is convince, let's call it five to 10% of his voters that I have their best interest at heart and I will do more for them. And I've been around the country and I've gotten dozens, hundreds of Trump supporters coming up to me saying, I voted for Donald Trump and I will vote for you because you're an outsider, you're telling the truth, you want to shake things up, you're an entrepreneur, like a lot of things I liked about Donald Trump, I like about you. And so I do not need to get 40, 50% of Trump voters to say that, I just need five to 10%. Because if you look at the, the constituencies, Hillary did win the popular vote by several million. Um, and all we need to do is we need to get like a slice of Trump supporters uh, over to my camp. And a lot of the reason they liked Donald Trump was that he actually acknowledged the problems. And the, just the fact that I'm acknowledging the problems sets me apart from virtually all the other politicians who are running. Well, I guess I wanted to um, kind of throw down a teaser for you. Uh, uh, not necessarily want to try and just start a debate or anything. And, and that is... Um, Asian Americans, as far as I know, uh, are pretty pragmatic. Uh, we are not ideologue, we're not extremes. Yep. Uh, either you're Democrats or Republicans. So part of, the, of your campaign is to appeal to the Asian Americans. I know that's not the whole game. I'm trying to say that next year, when Democrats start to field their candidates, many of those we know is, who are going to run are pretty, pretty liberal. Um, and, and can you run a little bit from the middle? So you have something on the economy, on technology, and you're, and you're more moderate. You're, you're, you kind of stand alone away from that democratic crowded field where a lot of them are pretty, pretty liberal. Unsolicited advice. Oh, look at that. That very, very naturally, I'm something of an independent. Uh, you know, again, just the fact that I've run a company uh, and sold it and started other businesses makes me somewhat unusual in the democratic field. Um, so the argument I'm making to many very liberal Democrats is that the freedom dividend would be a more effective means of improving the lives of the people that you care about than other things that we're talking about. Because let's say you care about women's rights. Getting $1,000 a month would enable hundreds of thousands of women to walk away from abusive relationships like uh, either work or professional. Like, you know, you put $1,000 in the hands of, of individuals, it's going to strengthen families, communities, and children. So I, I think I'm approaching the liberal priorities with like a different lens, um, but it's a lens that some people find to be like really refreshing and somewhat like new. I, I think if you look at it, like I don't actually fall cleanly into like a liberal or conservative camp. Someone called me the shuffler where I have uh, ideas that will appeal to people on either side. But if you look at what's happening nationally, 28% of Americans identify as Democrats, 
23% identify as Republicans, and 44% identify as independents. And I think that I naturally uh, am more aligned with like the giant middle um, than I am the democratic talking points of the last number of years, um, because I think many Americans have sort of lost faith in many of the policies that Democrats have been putting forward. Hi, Andrew. I'm uh, Glenn Fuji with the Papa. And uh, I did watch the YouTube video as well. But uh, a simple question. I know we talk about the dividend and, uh, income. So, so your platform to try to simplify the explanation of how it will be paid through your campaign, how are you going to sell that to all the various groups to, to simplify the concept for them to understand? Yeah, so what I do is I, I talk about our history and how something very much similar to the Freedom Dividend passed the House of Representatives in 1971 under Richard Nixon, and that one state has been giving people a dividend for 36 years, and that state's Alaska, where uh, they have the oil dividend, where everyone in that state now gets between $1,000 and $2,000 a year. And so what I suggest to people is that technology is the oil of the 21st century, and that we can do for the rest of the country what Alaska's done with oil. Now, that's like the simplistic way of explaining it to people, but then they think, oh, okay, technology will pay for this. And then they like, get like, okay, that makes sense, because um, they don't really think about like, the, the numbers. Um, what, but then when I go to the tech CEOs, I say, look, guys, the way we're going to pay for this is that right now the trap we're in is that the big winners from artificial intelligence and big data and autonomous vehicles are going to be Google, uh, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, like these trillion-dollar tech companies that do not pay a lot of tax because they say it all went through Ireland or we didn't make any money this quarter and they just don't pay a lot of taxes, which is fine. I mean, that's what companies are supposed to do. Companies are supposed to minimize their tax burden. But it's going to end up causing massive problems because these companies are going to soak up more and more value even as the public sees less and less of it. So what I tell people is we need to join every other industrialized country in the world and have a value-added tax, which will then give the public a tiny slice of every Amazon transaction, every Google search. And because our economy is now so vast, even a moderate VAT at half the European level would generate enough money to give everyone $1,000 a month that would then end up getting plowed back into the economy anyway. Um, and then the tech people I talk to say that's a much better plan than like a robot tax or an AI tax or something that's specific to innovation because the fact is I don't want to slow down innovation. Like we actually need more innovation to be able to improve people's lives. So that's the way I'm explaining it to the people on both sides. Yeah, every, certainly uh, every other um, major industrialized economy actually already has a VAT, like everyone in Europe, like uh, most of Asia. It's, it's the most effective tax. The fact that the U.S. doesn't have one is actually somewhat bizarre. Uh, and we need to move in that direction because over time, taxing labor gets dumber and dumber. Like, if anything, we should be trying to create more and more labor-type relationships and incentives. And the last thing you want to do is tax something you want more of. So over time, you should be trying to move things more and more towards uh, a VAT-type system and away from income taxes. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very common. And because it's so common, the great thing is all of our accounting firms already know how to do it because they're doing it for all of their multinationals in every other market. Okay, well, let's... Oh, SK, okay. <laughs> do you think there's enough money generated by your VAT um, to subsidize $1,000 per person over 18? Yeah, so there are four components to it. Number one is the VAT, which generates about $800 billion. Number two is existing welfare programs. Um, now, not all of it, but it does end up substituting and reducing the cost of it. So we spend about $800 billion on current welfare programs, and you can get maybe two-thirds of that um, that uh, ends up being redundant to the Freedom Dividend. Uh, and then the great thing is number three and four. So if you put $1,000 in the hands of an American consumer who right now cannot pay his or her bills, what are they going to do with that money? They're going to spend it on their, their bills and like car repairs and tutoring for their kids and uh, occasional night out. And all of that money ends up growing the economy. It creates several million new jobs. It creates hundreds of thousands of new businesses. And it ends up increasing our tax revenues by about $500 billion dollars which also then ends up paying for this thing. You get essentially a quarter of all of the money back in new revenue. 
And then the fourth thing, which is also really profound when you think about it, uh, we're going to save hundreds of billions on incarceration, homelessness services, health care, and emergency room health care, because if people have this money, they'll stay out of the ER as their primary care. Uh, there's one study that showed if you were to alleviate child poverty, you would in increase our GDP by $700 billion because of higher graduation rates, higher productivity, better health outcomes. The, the big problem in the U.S. right now is that, like how many of you have run a company, like, like me, run a company, I get the other sense. So when you run a company, CC, you like invest in your people all the time because you know they're going to be more productive and like, you know, going to end up uh, paying for themselves. But in the public sector, we try and avoid that at any, at any way we can. It's like everyone's a cost. We just have to avoid spending money on you. Um, but a prison guard in New Hampshire said something to me that was very true. He said, we should be paying people to stay out of jail because he sees how much money the prison system is wasting on incarcerating that person. Like when, when we try and avoid like investing in people, we just end up paying for it anyway, but in much more dark, perverse, dysfunctional, oppressive ways. Whereas if we just invest in them like from the beginning, then you can keep them strong and functional and grow the economy. So the VAT itself does not pay for the freedom dividend, but the VAT plus existing welfare spending, plus economic growth, plus better outcomes and value creation will pay for uh, the freedom dividend. So I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here with you all. If you'd like to get involved and help, please do just reach out to me or my campaign manager. But my email is very easy to remember. It's just andrewyang at gmail. I beat all of the other Andrew Yangs to andrewyang at gmail. You can go to yang2020.com, um, reach out to me individually, because I need your help. I need the Asian American community to get behind me, to help us reach that potential and help get me on that main debate stage in seven months. So thank you all very, very much. Have a great rest what? of your day here.